We're going to go now to visit the Native Here Nursery in the Berkeley Hills. Native Here is a nonprofit nursery that grows plants collected from seed from native plants found in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. We'll be uh, um, talking with Leslie, Kimberly, and Arlene, who are all volunteers with Native Here. So can I say hi to you? Hi, Leslie, I see you. And I saw- Hi, Kimberly. Kathy. Kimberly, are you on? She was okay. here this morning. All right, maybe she'll come back. Uh, and Arlene, is she with you, do you know? I haven't seen Arlene on the screen lately. Okay, so um, shall we then just launch right into the video? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, so Jessica, if you wanna go ahead. Perfect, and I've just ar added Arlene back in. Okay. I haven't seen Kimberly yet. Oh, that's not what I want. Un momento, por favor. Oh, there's, hi, Arlene. There we go. So the genus Ribes includes a lot of other species Kathy, besides that's the Ribes. the second half Union. of it. Oh, okay. Sorry, I had it mislabeled. Sorry, everybody. One quick second. Let's see. Let's see. That's not quite right. Da, 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 da. Thanks, guys. One sec. The Native Here Nursery is in Tilden uh, Regional Park, and here we go. There you go. Welcome to Native Here Nursery. We were founded in 1997 to grow plants that are native here by which we mean that the seeds are all locally collected and they are of the genotypes that belong to our local ecosystem. We do all our own seed collecting, always with landowner permission, anything else is stealing. We have policies about how much we take and how we do it so that we don't damage the source population. We grow our plants as naturally as possible. We water by hand, we follow sudden oak death protocols. We never fertilize unless it's a bulb in a pot. And we use the least possible invasive methods if we just encounter disease or pests. We have about 200 species of plants at any given time, 300 in the course of a year, maybe 400 in the course of five years. Because we are focused on local plants, we grow some unusual species. For instance, here's Brewer's rock crest, and we also carry trilliums. There are eight bioregions in the East Bay, as you can see on this map. We organize the nursery on the same principle. We have a variety of growing conditions, and then therefore we were able to match uh, various growing conditions to what the plants need. For instance, here in the shade, we have the Bay Hills plants, and over in the sun, we have the Diablo section, and the others are kind of allied where the conditions fit between the two of those. What we suggest you do to choose plants is to start with your own bioregion and see what's there. We have plant cards with every species with basic information on them, and our new website has more information on the plants, plus uh, instructions about how to grow them, plant them, situations you may run into, and other resources. In keeping with today's theme, we'll be talking about pollinator keystone species, those plants that offer a lot to a wide variety of pollinators and other insects and therefore tie the whole ecosystem together. We've organized them into three groups. Kimberly will begin by talking about oaks and their allies. Arlene will discuss the scrub community. And I'll finish up with some plants that can be used almost anywhere. We'll take a break after the Oaks presentation for questions. And with that, over to you, Kimberly. Many of our cities in Contra Costa County and Alameda County grew up under the protective canopy of oaks. These woodlands were made up of different proportions of, of mixed oak woodlands. Um, there were deciduous oaks, like, like the blue oak and the valley oak and evergreen oaks like the coastal live oak and interior live oak. In the understory, they mixed with um, 
canyon oaks and a variety of hybridizing scrub oaks. The oaks evolved to fit their land's characteristics, the timing of their flowering and fruiting, the temperature requirements of reproduction, the habits of the local squirrels and birds, even how often and how hot the local wildfires were, work together to allow one oak species to thrive and another to fall away. Because they are so common and so diverse, they play an outsized role in the life of a large proportion of California's organisms. Countless birds, mammals, and insects, and other plants depend on them for survival. The loss of our oaks to climate change and to development has meant an outsized loss of California's biodiversity. Perhaps we can do our part to reestablish oaks in our communities that once were dominated by them by bringing them and their associated species into our city streets, parks, and yards. Let's start with the Quercus agrifolia. They grow on the west side of the Bay Hills, um, but their range uh, goes from the west edge of the Central Valley all the way to the coast. Coast live oaks reproduce most easily in the areas that are influenced by the maritime um, climate. So their acorns sprout without needing to have that precipitous dip in temperatures in the winter that some of our other oaks like. As they mature, they, the taproot drops off and they develop a two to four foot deep and thick um, extending root system that, um, that their spreading canopy protects and feeds. Quercus lobata starts out very small, but grows into the largest oak in North America. The deciduous valley oak thrives in inland valleys uh, with deep soils and access to water. Their root systems go down 100 feet. They, um, they basically can live through lots of drought as well as flooding. They're very versatile. Some of the big, big oaks are thought to be um, up to 600 years old. Sadly, much of Quercus lobata's habitat has been removed. We're used to seeing them in grasslands, savannas, or uh, maybe a majestic remnant in Walnut Creek or along streams. They used to be the dominant woodland forest species throughout the Central Valley. The valley oak grows really quickly and grows really big. In 40 years, it's easily, you know, 40 feet high. So it may be a, a tree that's hard to fit into our urban gardens, but if you have a large yard with access to a creek or a high water table, this would be a great plant to add, um, bringing food and forage to so many, so many species. The California blue oak, Quercus douglasii grows throughout the Bay Area, but it really thrives in areas that are dry, rocky, gravelly, where the, the valley oak and the live oaks just don't grow as well. Its range is threatened by grazing and by invasive grasses and also the dropping water table. So climate change is affecting it too, but um, it has some things going for it. It is resistant to, to sudden oak death, which is taking out many of our coastal live oaks. And since it's found in the, many of the same areas in smaller amounts, perhaps as the climate changes, uh, the blue oak will come in and replace the coastal live oak in some areas. At Native Here, uh, we have species that are sourced from the Bay Hills, from Altamont, uh, from Mount Diablo, and uh, Sycamore Grove. So there may be a blue oak from your region that you can find. A favorite understory associate of oaks is Holodiscus discolor, also known as cream bush or ocean spray. They have fragrant white flowers in just thick clusters that probably is where they got their name. You find them growing in the shady understory down to about five feet, but then in the oak woodland openings, they sprout to 10 and even 18 feet. 
In the fall, the flowers dry and they persist on the plant. Um, so they're available for birds through the winter, but they also spread by the wind. The seeds are very light. And so they just blow across the hillside and you'll find clusters of these shrubs um, with a wave of, of cream colored flowers. Another favorite oak associate is Ribes sanguinum glutinosum. Ribes is really a beautiful plant. It grows about 10 feet tall. It has seasonal interests. So in the spring, it has those sprays of pink flowers that develop into really beautiful blue berries. The birds love them. And while you're gardening, you'll find them sweeping in and, and picking them off. And in the spring, hummingbirds dive bomb you to get at their flowers. On a final note, let's encourage our city planters to bring oaks back into our cities. Um, maybe there are oaks that would work as street trees. When trees die in parks, let's replace them with our native oaks. And um, bring some oaks back into your, into your yard. Look for scrub oaks or canyon oaks or, you know, see if you have room for uh, a plant that really feeds our, the biodiversity of our local environment. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to be stopping now. There's two videos from Native Here, and we'll be taking questions about oaks for a few minutes, and then we'll be going into the second half of their presentation. So um, I wonder if you could, uh, Leslie and Arlene and uh, Kimberly, if you're on, so maybe just rattle off again. What, um, what are some of the smaller oaks that might be good for our urban gardens? Okay, Kimberly, are you there? You're the expert. Then what I can tell you, and Arlene, you can help me out, uh, Chrysolepis, Rizlinii, Dorada. So Dorada is the leather oak, and the Chrysolepis is, what's its common name, do you remember? Am mm -hmm. I right? Is the Dorada leather? Interior, yes, you're right, Dorada is scrub. Um, and the... Uh, but Chrysolepis is interior live oak. Okay. Okay. And I just want to say about oaks that my husband and I planted uh, an oak in front of our house uh, 25 years ago. It was maybe six inches tall. We got it from probably the CNPS cell at Merritt College then. And it's now maybe 30 feet tall. It's magnificent. Like, and 30 years has, you know, gone by in the blink of an eye, really. But we have a magnificent oak in front of our house. And we also have a lovely buckeye we planted 22 years ago from seed, and it's also like 25 feet tall. So you don't really have to wait too long in the greater scheme of things to have to get a big change from a tree that you plant today. Now, Kimberly said that valley oaks grow about a foot a year on the average, and I found that to be the case with mine. I started with a slightly larger one than you did, Kathy, but it has grown a foot a year. Actually, I have three. So if people wanted to get an oak from Native here, what are your hours and your purchasing systems right now? At the moment, we're still not completely open to the public because a number of our volunteers are older and they're concerned about COVID-19. So we have a lovely new website uh, with a shop so that you can order remotely and then you can come on Saturdays between 10 and 2 and pick them up. And if you really can't make it on Saturdays, then we're there on Friday mornings as well, or we'll arrange something for you if all else fails. Okay, and roughly where are you located? Can you explain to people just driving wise? Well, we are, uh, if you look at it from the west side, at the very top of campus. If you come up through Berkeley, through the middle, and you take Centennial Drive from behind campus up to Grizzly Peak, then you can go right on to Golf Course Road and in about three quarters of a mile, you're there. If you come up from the freeway, then uh, get off at Fish Ranch Road and follow Grizzly Peak. If you come from the north, come south on Grizzly Peak. So you're not far from the Tilden Regional, the, the Tilden Botanic Garden, right? That's right, it's about half a mile. Yeah, okay. As the crow flies. So uh, Denise asked, uh, how old uh, do oaks have to be before they attract butterflies and moths? And Denise, you probably came in late to Doug Tallamy's lecture because he had the cutest photo of a, 
little tiny oak like this big and a caterpillar like stretching up from the ground to get at the leaf. So they don't have to be big at all. They start providing habitat right away. Yes, you do need to understand about oaks, however, they are host plants. Uh, so they have caterpillars and they have many, many other insects, which are not what we think of as traditional pollinators, but are the nevertheless food for birds and other things. Uh, and that is how they got their title as the, uh, the keystone species for our ecosystem. So, um, uh, what was it she asked me in the beginning? Oh, about butterflies. You know, you really aren't going to see that many except when they're laying eggs. All right, so why don't we go on now and watch the second video that um, you had made. So Jessica, if you want to go ahead and launch that. This will be Arlene talking when we come back. So the genus Ribes includes a lot of other species besides the Ribes sanguinium that Kimberly talked about. In general, those other species are from the drier habitats. They could be from woodland edges or from uh, scrub. And scrub is kind of a generic term for open areas that have a lot of shrubs. It could be a soft scrub in the Bay Hills or it could be hard chaparral um, in the hotter areas. Here we have the chaparral current, Ribes malvasium which can span all those habitats ranging from fairly cool moist coastal areas to hot dry inland chaparral and uh, the flowers are less conspicuous but sort of similar to the sanguinium and here we have a little one gallon pot and a two gallon pot that's on its way up to the ultimate size of potentially eight feet so ribes californicum or i think it's canyon gooseberry is one of the spiny ones and this group generally has small pink and white flowers not very conspicuous but the birds still like the berries and this one generally grows in wooded sort of semi-wooded canyon areas the common name sage actually applies to quite a few medium-sized evergreen shrubs uh, they are all kind of similar size they have generally fragrant foliage so the, um, they kind of get grouped now in the genus salvia or true sages we have salvia mellifera which is a black sage and it's a real foundational habitat plant in a lot of the drier areas it mounds up to about five feet or so uh, has nice flowers in the spring and produces seeds also that are helpful um, but then this plant called pitcher sage is actually a lepicinia and uh, it's got bigger, fuzzier leaves and it has showier flowers, which attract hummingbirds as well as the bees. So those two are both in the mint family, but then out of the sunflower family, we've got Artemisia californica, which is California sage brush. Um, and it's again, a very common widespread plant throughout the state. Uh, and it's a little more dominant in drier areas, but um, It'll grow well and has the nice foliage on it. Here in the nursery, we use specimen plants to provide some of our seed and cutting stock. So this larger Artemisia californica shows what the sagebrush will look like um, when it gets older. Now, all of these are gonna go semi-dormant when they get less water. So they'll keep their leaves to some extent and it varies. Here I'm in the uh, holding area for our Mount Diablo section where we keep the recently potted plants and grow them out until they can be sold. So we've got at least five species or subspecies of manzanita back here. This is genus Arctostaphylos. So it's a very special genus, um, especially in California. On the mountain, they are backbones of the chaparral community, but each one has its preferences for the soil type and exposure, whether north facing or south facing. And we do have a handout from one of our past talks that explains what are the, the ways uh, that each one likes to be grown. Now we do have an extreme caution for people to not plant Arctostaphylos auriculata um, in areas that are 
within the range of the endangered pallid manzanita because we don't want to contaminate the gene pool. Here we have Arctostaphylos glauca, which is very popular because it's the big berry manzanita. And you can see here the immature fruits on our specimen plant. All chaparral plants like at least reasonable drainage, but that's especially true for manzanitas. Unless you're on a steep slope, our planting guidelines are dig a large enough hole, mix drain rock into the backfill, and mound it to raise the plant crown. Plant in fall, and be sure to plan for the plant's eventual size. Chaparral plants do best with little or no pruning. Again, especially true for manzanitas. California has a lot of buckwheats that are in the genus Areogonum, and they're generally perennials or subshrubs that are low to the ground and provide a lot of food and shelter for little critters running around. Plus, they have pom-pom flower heads in the summer for pollinators. Now we come to the last of our groups of plants, the understory. Things in the understory are usually three feet tall or less, and they fit in between the larger foundation plants that Arlene and Kimberly have discussed. One of the most popular of these plants is bush lupin. It's a shrub that grows three feet tall and wide. Here you see it in a spot overlooking the bay. And here it is on Mount Diablo in an entirely different situation, surrounded by different plants. So it's very versatile, which is what makes it popular. Next is woodland lupin. It is an uncommon plant in the East Bay, a perennial, grows in a mixture of sun and shade, and gets two to four feet tall under normal circumstances, but could be as much as eight. Uh, it's proving popular with people, uh, and it might be a nice addition to your garden too. It's not only the spring when pollinators need food, it's also summer. Uh, so let's talk next about a couple of plants that will help our pollinators get through the summer. First of all, we've got goldenrod. Goldenrod is a very useful plant in a wide variety of situations. We have two local species which are quite similar. This is how it looks at this time of year. Um, we have um, western goldenrod that's quite tall, blooms in the summer, loves sun and water, uh, and is therefore good for creeks. Um, and then we have uh, California goldenrod, which blooms in the fall in grasslands and woodlands, and is one to two feet tall. So well, goldenrod has the waterfront pretty well covered. In conclusion, we hope you found this video useful in planning your own garden to support local pollinators and other insects. We hope you'll plant them generously to sustain our local ecosystem. All right, well, thank you very much. That was fabulous, Leslie. Thank you, Kathy. I noticed that someone asked about uh, uh, valley oaks and uh, coast and dug with, uh, blue oaks doing well on the bay side. And the answer is that blue oaks really don't thrive. They just need drier, conditions than they've got Bayside. Um, valley oaks do better because they do look for some water when they choose their spots. Okay, so um, if people go to your website, I know there's two things that would be of interest to them. One is your plant list, which people can see then what you have in your availability list that is locally native to Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Uh, and also you've got a great butterfly list there in their plants. Do you want to talk about your availability in the butterfly lists? Um, the butterfly list is a brand new addition. We had an old list, which is still there, and they're sort of complementary to each other. The old list goes from plant to the butterflies that are dependent on it. So if you've got a plant you want and want to see how well butterflies will do with it, then uh, that's the one to use. But if you want to encourage a particular butterfly, uh, then the other one will allow you to look up all the plants associated with it. Okay, I see that Richard said, I planted a valley oak from an acorn in 1984. It is 40 feet high and happy. So that's nice to hear, huh? Yes. 
So uh, if someone comes, say they live in Livermore, say they live in Oakland, what will happen when they come to Native Care? How will they find out, you know, what plants are from their area? Um, we organize the nursery that way. Uh, we need to replace our sign at the entrance that it, uh, shows the bioregion map and also the layout of the nursery that you saw in the video. Uh, and once, once we get that done, which we will take care of this coming week, uh, then you simply look at it, figure out where you live and which bioregion that's in, and then look at the nursery layout and go there first. Now, it's not that you can't plant stuff from other places, and it's not that uh, ecosystems don't vary, uh, even within an area, and you'll have to exercise your own judgment there, and you know, we're there to answer questions to help you do that if you're not experienced. Uh, but look at the stuff first that is your local community, and then, uh, you know, branch out as you need to to find stuff you really want for whatever purpose you want to put your garden to. Mm -hmm. So okay. I wanted to... Do we have a couple of minutes? We have a number of questions here. Do we have a couple? Uh, let's see. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you was if you need volunteers and what volunteers would do for you. We always like to have more volunteers, of course. Um, and we do everything. We need to water the plants. Uh, we have to pop them up. Uh, they need to be transported from one place to another in the nursery. And once they're potted, they have to be put away to grow for a while, etc. and then they have to be brought to the sales floor. Uh, we need to scout for disease. Kimberly is in charge of that for us. Um, Arlene is an expert waterer, uh, in addition to being an expert on plants. Uh, and, uh, well, I've said enough about that. As you can see, wide variety of stuff. All right, good. Well, uh, you can contact them if you are uh, interested in volunteering at Native Year. I know I've shopped at Native Year and uh, really appreciate the work that the uh, Native Year does and that the East Bay chapter of the California Society uh, does and the support that it's given to the tour over the years. So thank you very much for being with us today and uh, for producing such a fabulous video. It was great. Well, you're welcome. I'm sorry it didn't quite come off as smoothly on Zoom as it did on our uh, computer screens as we watched it and put it together, but uh, you'll post it later, so it'll be fine. It will be. I do want to add, can, if I could add one thing, because a lot of um, people have referred to Calscape, and Calscape um, gives an estimated range based on where the plant could survive based on soil and climate. But your microclimate could dictate that you come from a different area of the Bay Hills is the better match for you or something like that. So that's why we encourage people to sort of stroll around and check out not just the plants that are closest to them in geographical distance. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to have a uh, demonstration with Calscape next weekend, uh, next Sunday morning. We're going to be doing Calscape on my yard, and uh, Emery Benz from uh, California Native Plant Society will be uh, working on a demo with us then. So Arlene, Leslie, Kimberly, I want to thank you, and also Greg, who I think is watching from Pennsylvania. I hope that he enjoyed seeing this video yeah. showing today. Thank you very much for all your hard work. You're welcome. All right, we're gonna go on now. So, share screen. Yes. Yeah. Click, click. There's Kimberly. Click, click.